Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out for another edition of NMIH's Virtual Museum. Today we're talking about a very uh, popular topic for us, iron versus steel, and the difference between those two metals and how they're used in industry. Uh, today's talk is being presented by Mike Thiersa. He's the museum's historian. Mike graduated with a bachelor's in history from Moravian College and a master's in history from Lehigh University, both Bethlehem schools. He's been with NMIH in some capacity for over 17 years now and has been in, uh, instrumental in the research and interpretation behind our collections and what, you, what you've seen in the museum if you've been to our um, facility. He's also presented around the country on his work with Industrial Heritage and has been instrumental in the preservation and operational restoration of our massive 115 ton coil steam engine. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Mike. Thank you for having me. So uh, today is also one of a few talks that the museum is having. You can check out the various talks that we have on our website at nmih.org. We have an entire month of May full of different uh, presentations that we're gonna have, be having from people across the country and indeed across the world. We have someone calling in from England, which is gonna be very interesting about Roebling, who is the engineer behind the Brooklyn Bridge. And we also have a speaker talking about the British Industrial Revolution. Uh, you can find all those talks and more on our website at nmih.org or right here on our Facebook page. Um, there's also a couple ways that you can help us out right now. We're obviously doing all this content for free for everyone at home. Um, we're glad you're able to join us. If you're able to help us and help us continue these great programs, help us keep saving history um, while we're closed, there's a couple different ways that you can help out. One is just making a donation to the museum. Any donation that you can make will help us out and help us continue what we do. Um, you can also purchase a membership. Those memberships will be good for one year from the day that we reopen the museum. And you can also use Amazon Smile. If you're ordering things online, instead of using Amazon.com, go to smile.amazon.com and select the National Museum of Industrial History as your charity of choice. And part of your purchase will go towards our museum with no additional cost to you. Um, so there's a couple different ways that you can help us out. There's more at nmih.org. You can find out on how to make a donation to the museum or various different ways that you can help us out during this time. Um, but for right now, we have a great talk on iron versus steel coming up from Mike. So I'm gonna pass it over to him and thanks for joining us. Great, before we get started with the slideshow, I just want to preface this with uh, saying that I am a historian, I'm not a metallurgist. My experience with uh, these different types of metals usually comes in the hands-on means, like we literally dig something up, try to figure out what it is, wind up in a rubbish pile, or in the case of like the coreless steam engine, why did a certain part break? And you really get into some really interesting metallurgical questions when you uh, have to go and repair this stuff. So I'm gonna begin uh, sharing my slideshow with you so we can take a closer look at what the difference between iron and steel really is. So just posting this in here and it should be uploading momentarily. Normally this is done uh, in person in a hands-on scenario. So I usually have a bunch of rusty, broken stuff, kind of a hall of failures I can show you guys. So some of the best way to understand these uh, concepts is to see the stuff right in front of you where you can hold it, touch it, feel it, understand how it was made, how it was used, and why one material is better than another by studying how they broke. So the first part of this presentation is gonna focus on iron. So where do you guys think iron comes from? Uh, obviously uh, you see a lot of it coming from the ground, but uh, where would it come from originally? Like the first people thousands of years ago, did it fall out of the sky? Did they trip over it? Well, the answer is really all of the above. This is a slice of a meteorite. And uh, for ancient uh, people, especially the Egyptians, it was very common for how common this type of material was, which was fairly rare. But if you're gonna find a piece of iron, odds are you're gonna find it back then as a meteoric iron that had come to earth from the sky. You find it on the ground, uh, you pick it up and heat it, start forging it into something useful. Another common place you would find iron was in bogs. This is iron that uh, was naturally precipitated up from the ground as iron that came up in spring water and then bacteria and enzymes got a hold of it and helped convert it into these big, uh, a little bit larger than the football-sized lumps of iron that populated bogs and swamps. 
So if you look at early ironworks, uh, like uh, the one at Alaris State Park in New Jersey, those were located where they were, far away from mountains and iron ore uh, uh, geologic deposits that were mined uh, in later years. They were in coastal areas, like in that situation, they were close to large cities where you had a market for iron, but they had the swamps and bogs with these iron deposits. So they went in, mined these things, and built their furnaces. The interesting, the interesting thing about these deposits of iron is they're actually, to some extent, renewable, because once you mine them, the groundwater is still going to continue precipitating iron, so you could go back uh, decades later and mine them again if you wanted to. But this was only really practical on a small scale. This is a piece of magnetite ore found at Bethlehem Steel's Cornwall iron mine. This was a massive mine uh, down near Lebanon, Pennsylvania. You can still see the pits down there today. It's water filled, looks like a giant lake. But this is where they actually did hard rock mining, open pit and eventually tunnels to get iron ore out. And this is what it would look like inside an actual iron ore mine. This was shot at the Ruffner of Mountain Mines in Alabama near Birmingham. Birmingham was the Pittsburgh of the South. And there was a mountain that was uh, just riddled with iron mines like this. And you can believe it's iron. It's rusty. Uh, iron uh, is not for found generally in the pure sense. It's combined with oxygen. So when you have iron ore, it's really iron and oxygen combined, which is the same thing basically as rust. So that's why iron, even in uh, some of its metallic forms, looks rusty. So the earliest ways of actually getting iron uh, from the form of raw ore that really wasn't all that useful into an actual metal product that you could use for like a knife or a nail was to build a bloomery furnace. These date back uh, thousands of years. And they're the simplest form of furnace. It's really a shaft. Uh, this is a replica that we had here at the museum, literally for one day. That's all it lasted. Uh, we'll explain that more later. Uh, but it's a shaft, maybe 18 inches in diameter, three feet tall. We cheated a little bit and used uh, bricks, but it's really made of clay, manure, straw, and uh, some wrapping to help uh, solidify it, give it some extra strength. Normally these would be built of stones and usually built into a hillside. And you would try to point them in the direction that the wind would blow into them because there would be, there would be a little hole at the bottom that air would blow through and the air would provide the oxygen for the uh, chemical reaction that goes on inside the furnace. Uh, we cheated uh, in this example, we we're using a leaf floor which is piped in from the left of the picture, but it provided air and it uh, did what it needed to do. Uh, sure be waiting on the wind. Uh, in uh, later years, and by later years, I mean hundreds of years ago, you were still using bellows to artificially provide that wind. Uh, Africa even used monkey skin uh, for uh, the bellows. So what you have in this uh, container here is a mixture of iron ore and charcoal. You don't want to just go putting uh, regular wood into this. Uh, because what has resins, uh, organic matter, and who knows what, that uh, is really going to mess up the uh, uh, metallurgy of what you're getting out. So if you convert the wood to charcoal by baking the wood in a relatively oxygen-free environment, you burn out those impurities, and you're left with something that's primarily carbon. And carbon is what you want in this, because the carbon combines with the oxygen in the iron ore, and then that forms carbon monoxide gas. And you can see that gas igniting very imperceptibly uh, as these little kind of like purplish flames right above the furnace there. It's a lot easier to see when you do this at nighttime. But once the oxygen burns off, you're left with uh, iron. And before we run to that, I want to note one little special thing we're doing in this furnace here. We're not just using iron ore, we're using iron that was reclaimed from acid mine drainage. We believe this was the world's first example of taking uh, acid mine drainage from a coal mine, which is primarily iron that's leached out in the ground, and they fill up a containment pond with it, because normally this iron would go into the rivers. And if you look at a satellite view of, say, the Lackawanna River, where it meets uh, the Susquehanna River, you'll see the first few miles of Lackawanna River are dyed orange because of acid mine drainage. So what you can actually do is take this uh, drainage, solidify it, and you can actually harvest the iron from it. So we actually 
uh, worked with the Eastern Pennsylvania Coalition for Abandoned Mine Reclamation and got a few pounds of this reclaimed iron. And uh, for functional purposes, it's a lot like iron ore. And you can actually be that in the furnace and we actually got metallic iron out with this thing. We also used uh, leftover taconite, which we'll explain at some point. And uh, we also used iron ore, but the bottom line is we had an iron supply that we smelted down and you add a layer of iron ore, a layer of charcoal, and you just keep on repeating this process throughout the day. We started around 10 a.m. in the morning and around 4 p.m. at the evening, we opened the furnace up. Theoretically, there should be a few bricks blocking up the bottom, filled with mud. You should be able to remove those bricks and pull what they call a bloom of iron out. This is iron that's been converted chemically and also melted down partially. Uh, it's kind of like a big spongy mass. In this example, the iron bloom we got was a little bit too big for the hole, so we ended up busting the entire side of the furnace out. You can see the uh, burning coals down at the bottom and the tongs pulling the actual bloom of iron. And here we are taking the bloom of iron and putting it onto a big wooden block and hammering it out. This iron is also mixed with slag. Slag is a byproduct of uh, the iron manufacturing operation. So and in, in, it's not just oxides that uh, come, oxygen that comes off, it's also some of the impurities. They're, ideally these would float away, but in practice these uh, get uh, conjoined with the iron. A lot of these are slag based, which is silica. So if you think about what silica is found in, it's found in glass. So in this particular example, that's actually a good thing for us because this iron ended up getting mixed with these silicate particles. So it's like having little tiny strands of glass uh, for layman's terms mixed in with the iron that gives it a lot of uh, corrosion resistance and strangely enough helps make it pliable and ductile. So when you get this big lump of iron out, what you wanna do is hammer it together and try to make it homogenous because the quality, it's not thoroughly mixed. It's really a very rough product. So after you get this lump of iron solidified, you can uh, uh, start hammering it down in a red hot state. Sometimes you wanna reheat it. And this, you might have to do this several times and eventually start drawing it out into a bar. And you can see these uh, stages as you eventually get it uh, more and more looking like a usable product here. And this is done by just repeated hammering and hammering and hammering. Now, after you've hammered it a number of times, drawn it out, and you can start forging it like a traditional blacksmith would uh, like he's making a nail. In this case, um, our volunteers made uh, knives. You can uh, see after they etched them how the different layers of high carbon and low carbon areas join together and create a really interesting pattern. Uh, the same basic process was used. We can talk about more in depth later on about like making Damascus steel and other uh, really interesting and uh, early uh, steel uh, manufacturing operations. But the big point of this is all of this is small scale. If you start at 10 a.m. in the morning and finish at 4 p.m. with a crew of two or three guys, then you only end up with 30 pounds of iron and even less of that is actually usable. And then you have to go and forge it by hand into a product. You're looking at something that's very, very labor intensive and ultimately very expensive to make. So there's uh, some more close-up shots of those grains to really see that this is a handmade product. You're not gonna get a grain like that uh, coming off of a machine today. So what started happening was to make iron on a larger scale, they started building larger furnaces. And once you started building larger furnaces, you're able to get more air pumped into them. And you can see in this diagram, once you surpass the means of a single man or a group of guys to pump a bellows, you started using water power. So you have uh, water driving a water wheel, driving a pair of bellows, or what you would call blowing tubs. You can actually see an example of this at Hopewell Furnace, um, south of Reading. It's a National Park Service site. We actually visited and explored this in person. But they have uh, these blowing tubs that are basically big cylinders that pump air into the furnace. Uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind is to make one ton of iron, it takes four tons of air. That ratio has improved over the years, but that's a good ballpark figure to go with. So what happens in this furnace is the iron is layered in with charcoal, iron ore is layered in with charcoal. You have that blast of air going through it. 
and then uh, the heat is so intense here, and the chemical reaction is occurring at such a rate that you can actually get liquid iron puddling up at the bottom of the furnace, and you can tap the iron out and make things with it. This is an example of an abandoned furnace out in Ohio. You can see that they were often built into hillsides. If you have a waterway, that'll give you a drop for the water wheel. And then because you're charging material like hundreds, thousands of pounds a day into these things, you want to go from the top and just go in a nice horizontal path across that nice stone bridge, drop it into the furnace, and let gravity do the work from there. So after you made uh, your liquid iron, you could do a couple of thing things with it. In some cases, you would pour it into a mold and make a product. This is sand casting, which is really a lecture in itself and a demonstration we do at the museum on a small scale. We have a sand mold, or in some cases, it was literally just the sand floor in front of the furnace. Carve a pathway that you want the iron to fill into, or for a more complex shape, or something that you want to repeat. Like uh, in Pennsylvania, a very common thing was a stove back. That would be like in the back of a fireplace. And you would uh, fill, use a, make a wooden pattern, compress that into the sand. The pattern would be an exact duplicate of what you want to see coming out of the sand as iron. So this wooden pattern goes in the sand, the sand's packed around it, the pattern is removed, and then the hollow void is filled with molten iron and it takes the shape of that wooden part that made the imprint. Now this is the same basic process that still goes on to this day. Wooden patterns are still used. Some people are actually 3D printing pattern now. So I can call up a friend of mine, and actually a couple of them by now, and say, hey, can you make a pattern for me? They can draw it on their computer, print it out in their kitchen while they sleep overnight, and then the next day they can have a pattern that they can take to a foundry. Uh, this is very good for making irregular shapes. This is uh, an example right here that was cast by Bethlehem Steel in their foundry. This is a lining for the Hudson and Manhattan Railway tunnel between New York and New Jersey. It's a, a curved piece, so when you think about uh, modern steel making processes, it's easier to make things flat and long. But if you want to make something curved and have braces in there, that's really something that is best suited for casting because liquid metal can fill all those irregular shapes very easily. So this uh, was duplicated literally thousands and thousands of times and used to make a tunnel lining to keep uh, the train safe as they travel beneath the river. So the other thing blast furnaces can produce was pig iron. This is an image, if you remember that furnace in Ohio, it would have had a building built on the front of it, protecting a bed of sand. You want the sand to stay dry. If you have uh, the sand get wet and liquid metal come in contact with it, uh, the water and the sand would actually flash into steam and cause an explosion and liquid metal would go flying and a lot of people have been injured and killed that way. So inside this building called the cast house, workers would make trenches in the sand. And at the side trenches here, you can see these little fingers coming out. When those are fit, filled with liquid metal, they would glow uh, kind of orangish. And the worker was said that it looked like piglets suckling a sow. So that's how the iron became known as pig iron. These uh, little fingers of iron, uh, which are actually about, let's say, two feet long in real life and longer depending on which operation you were at would be broken off from the main runners and stacked up like firewood and sold to foundries. Today you can use pig iron, but because there's so much iron in the world, uh, there's much lower demand for pig iron because you can take scrap iron, in this case brake shoes, and actually melt that down. Bethlehem Steel, besides having blast furnaces, also had their own cupola furnaces. These were places where you would take the pig iron or scrap iron and remelt it. You take the pig iron, layer it with uh, anthracite coal, uh, which was the common method between the era of charcoal and coke. So anthracite uh, was used in the mid-19th century, but by 1875, they started converting it over to coke. Coke is coal, which like charcoal had been baked. Uh, so it was in a fairly oxygen-free environment. And as you bake the coal, the impurities are removed. The impurities get piped to a chemical plant where they're processed into hundreds of different chemicals. And what's left of the coal is referred to as coke. It's very high in carbon because, again, the carbon is what's really doing the work here. So you pile the coke and pig iron in alternating layers, blow air through them, and that melts the pig iron, and you get metallic iron out again. And this is an example of a small cupola furnace here. 
This is actually portable that goes on the road. It, uh, this was seen at Scranton at the International Cast, Contemporary Cast Iron Arts Conference a couple of years ago. They have a little elevator that goes to the top, dumps the raw material in, the shaft where the uh, layers of pig iron and coke uh, are stacked up. Then what they have here is a wind box that encircles the furnace and they have uh, uh, tweers, which are little tubes that go into the furnace and blow the air into it. And then what you don't see here is the connections to a blower, which would provide the blast of air. So this is what it looks like inside one of those furnaces when it's actually running. This is a view from the top down. You can see from the top, it gets, as you go down, it gets hotter and hotter and therefore brighter and brighter. And then you have a nozzle on the front that you would tap the raw material, sorry, not the raw material, uh, cast iron out of after it's been melted. And then uh, what happened here in this case is this is at the very end of the run. There's doors that swing down from the bottom of these cupola furnaces and you can actually empty out the entire furnace. And that's what they did here with the sand bottom that was on the furnace and then whatever material was left in there. It's really a spectacular sight. And uh, that allows cupola furnaces to uh, work on the batch process. You can fire them up once every couple of weeks. And that's uh, how a lot of foundries uh, historically work. They would spend several days working on the molds and the sand that the patterns were going into, getting those ready, and then spend a day pouring iron, then start the process over again. So this is an example of what that particular furnace made. Again, it gets back to cast iron being uh, liquid that you can uh, fill into a mold and make a whole variety of shapes. That's why it's popular with artists because they can carve something like a wooden pattern with all these strange shapes that you uh, only an artist can imagine. Uh, fill it with iron and then uh, you have a solid piece that lasts for generations. Now cast iron when it comes out of the furnace has a lot of that carbon uh, picked up along the way. So it's about 4% carbon which is great if you want something that's strong but carbon also as you get higher carbon content makes it brittle. When you look at that uh, material that was coming out of that earlier furnace, the bloomery, that was very low in carbon, uh, but it had a little bit of silica in it, so that meant it was pliable. But as you uh, increase the carbon, that gives you more strength, but also makes it more brittle. So you have all these trade-offs when you're considering what type of iron to use. So this is a little chart, breaking it down. So we just saw with the example of those like artist sculptures, was an example of liquid iron, gray cast iron actually, but it flows into the mold, fills it up, and it's about 4% carbon, which is fine for strength. But if you wanna make something that's really, really strong, uh, like a rolling mill roll that you're gonna squeeze steel between, that's really not gonna cut it. But that you want white cast iron, and to get that, instead of pouring it into a typical sand mold, you would pour it into a mold that had uh, pieces of iron uh, wrapped around it, iron would cool faster than the sand, and the uh, iron that uh, is in contact with those chills would actually harden quicker and uh, become a harder substance, which would have a higher strength. So that's good, again, for certain applications where you want that strength. Um, but again, if you try bending a roll or something like that, that strength is gonna come back to bite you because it's not combined with ductility. So what happened in the mid 20th century was they finally found a way to, we actually found a way in the 19th century too by heat treating. But in the 20th century, they found a way to chemically change iron. So it's not just uh, strong and brittle, but strong and durable or ductile. So when you look at the iron up close, you can see on the left-hand side, typical gray cast iron, which is what you would have had for hundreds of years, uh, has graphite flakes into it. Graphite is the form that the carbon took. So that's great for a lot of applications, but it's not good if you want something that bends. So if you want something that bends, you want that graphite to take a round form. Uh, and if you look at that middle picture B, um, that shows the graphite that's taking that round form. So just imagine that bends a whole lot easier than those more linear graphite flakes that you see in the image on the left and the much uh, older examples of iron. So ductile iron is actually a fantastic product. It's made locally here in the Lehigh Valley by Vitalik. They use it for pipe couplings. So if you have pipes that might bend or sway or face hammering or uh, who knows uh, what other kind of uh, abuse they might take, you don't want to have the rest of them shattering because they're strong and brittle. You want them to be strong and bendable. 
so the ductile iron is really what makes that possible. And you do uh, that by adding magnesium uh, to the iron. There's other methods of making it too. So that was cast iron. Uh, the other thing you guys have probably heard about in the world of iron is wrought iron. If you look at uh, ship anchors, you'll often see these on display uh, at docks, uh, on the waterfront. You'll notice like an old ship anchor often looks like it's made out of wood. That's because it has a grain to it. Uh, this grain comes from uh, slag. It's very similar to that early uh, wrought iron, early uh, bloomery iron. Well, this is uh, made on an industrial scale uh, here in the next process. What we're actually looking at here is a piece of railroad rail. Uh, the very earliest railroad rails were uh, cast iron over in England, but those broke uh, almost immediately after they started putting any sort of meaningful loads on them with a the locomotive. So they quickly realized that you needed something stronger. Uh, so they went to wrought iron. Wrought iron was great for making rails um, because it was pliable. You could have the weight of the train uh, flex, uh, make, the, make the rails flex a little bit so they wouldn't shatter under that, but they weren't very strong. Uh, they would wear out very quickly. That's one of the reasons why when we find wrought iron rails, it's usually because they were tossed over the edge of a railroad uh, embankment and buried. So to make wrought iron on an industrial scale, you actually start with cast iron. Um, in this picture here, you can see a pile of uh, pig iron on the lower left-hand corner of the picture. This guy is uh, working a puddling furnace. You're not going to find these anywhere in the United States that we know of. If you do know of one, please tell us, because I'd love to see one in person. Uh, but this guy uh, would fill this furnace up with pig iron. Uh, it would be heated by a coal flame in an uh, adjacent chamber. So here you can see the coal on the right. The heat bounces off the top of the furnace, heats up the pig iron in here, and the exhaust goes out the smokestack. And the more efficient operations would take, actually take the waste heat and use it to warm up boilers which would make steam, which would run steam engines. So what they did with this uh, pig iron inside the furnace, which was cast iron, is they had to figure out a way to lower the carbon content. So uh, it's not as simple as just uh, uh, burning it off. You're starting with a piece of solid metal, so it has to be heated up to the melting point. And because it has carbon, carbon acts like road salt. When you put uh, salt on ice, the melting point gets lower. And that's the same thing that happens with carbon. So when you have cast iron with 4% carbon, it's going to have a comparatively low melting point compared to steel so or, or wrought iron. So the cast, the cast iron is going to melt. But as it melts, the carbon uh, burns off, which is what you want it to do, because you don't want all of that carbon in there. And uh, as you burn the carbon off, uh, it's like uh, getting rid of that road salt. Uh, it's going to start solidifying. So these guys actually go around with, uh, uh, they call them rabbles, this long poker stick, and start gathering the iron up as it solidifies in the furnace. It starts out as little lumps. And eventually, uh, they get into one to 200 pound lumps. And that's about all that uh, one or two guys can really handle. And they pull that out of the furnace. And when that emerges, uh, it's got very, very little carbon left into it. And it's also picked up some of the slag that was uh, left over as impurities. And we mentioned before that the slag is silica-based. Silica is a lot is mainly the main ingredient in glass. So for layman's terms, you have uh, the same benefits of glass, like that corrosion resistance, which is fantastic for iron. That's one of the reasons why you have iron ships. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, navies used wrought iron anchors for a long time, because they were corrosion resistant going in and out of the water like that and wrought iron pipes. They were making wrought iron pipe and rigging into the 1950s and using it in buildings. You can still go to buildings in New York and I'm sure uh, find uh, rigging wrought iron pipe and then away inside those walls because it was corrosion resistant and uh, very, uh, very durable. So moving on, once you have this big lump of wrought iron, you have to figure out how do you actually make it into a product? And just as you saw in that earlier bloomery picture where the guy was hammering it by hand, you do the same basic thing with these 200 pound chunks of wrought iron, but you would use a power hammer. In this drawing uh, from uh, Europe, you see a uh, uh, probably water powered uh, trip hammer that raises this big weight, drops it down on the chunk of iron and hammers it out. 
some of the slag is, slag is expelled, and a little bit of it is uh, pounded back into the iron to pound the stout, uh, fold it over on itself again, reheat it, and they might do this multiple times, trying to get the consistency of iron to be purer and purer. Now, the same thing happened here at the Bethlehem Iron Company. When they opened in 1863, they were making wrought iron, and instead of hammering it out into small products, they got into pieces big enough that they could run it through a rolling mill and actually make railroad rail from it. But in the 1850s, Sir Henry Bessemer over in England was realizing that um, if you could make steel on an industrial scale, steel would be a much more superior product. Instead of having a small uh, silica content like the wrought iron does, you take the iron and you combine it with a little bit of carbon. If you have maybe one quarter of 1%, uh, of that material being carbon, that's just the right mixture for having structural steel that could bend and be strong. So you had iron uh, companies here in the Lehigh Valley developing to the point that they became giant operations. This is what the Allentown Iron Works looked like. Uh, again, it was a huge place, but they were making this kind of product. It was railroad rails, among other things. But uh, the quality of the iron was so poor that if you compare the shape of this railroad rail to modern railroad rails, you realize that there is a lot more material in here. Modern rails have a square corner, square corners on them. This has rounded edges, so there's more material because they knew that this was really a junky product. And you can see in this close-up uh, why it was uh, a problem. Iron could delaminate, separate. It was weak compared to steel. Uh, so steel would last six to 10 times longer. So as soon as they could get rid of wrought iron and go to steel, most places that, that could afford to do so did that. And that put those iron companies out of business within a couple of decades for the most part. So this is what uh, steel looks like up close, like a piece of structural steel. When you look at the grain, you can see it's not linear and bendy like uh, that wrought iron. It's uh, more compact, more crystalline. So it is possible to break steel and shatter it. Um, but by and large, it's still very flexible. It's adequate for what you need to do. Um, and it's uh, nowhere near as brittle as cast iron. So it's really the ideal medium of those materials. So the earliest ways of making steel were actually through a crucible method, where you would take uh, wrought iron, sorry, cast iron and wrought iron. And again, remember, cast iron has that carbon. Carbon acts like uh, salt and road salt in the wintertime. As you uh, uh, want to lower the melting point, you put uh, that salt or carbon in there. So that carbon in the uh, steel making furnaces actually migrate from the cast iron to the wrought iron. And it kind of uh, uh, starts balancing out uh, uh, depending on what kind of steel you want and carbon content, um, uh, these small batches. But it only worked in small batches because you had to uh, heat it up get the heat to transfer through. And then even then it wasn't really a perfect process. You had to go and hammer this out to make it more homo homogenous. And it was really, really a small uh, batch process. In this case, they started changing the fuel from charcoal to coke and they were able to actually get the steel liquid at this point. You can see the guy pouring a ladle into a larger mold. They could pull, pour several crucibles into a mold and get a larger chunk of uh, crucible steel. And that was actually used up until the 20th century for making tool steel and other high carbon, very specialized steels that needed very fine controls. So now that we're entering the steel age, let's actually look at what it looked like at the outside at the Bethlehem Iron Company. It doesn't seem all that different from the Allentown rolling mills, which are making just iron. Uh, so there was this period in the late 19th century that was kind of hard to tell on the outside, but once you started going inside these places, you realize that there was a world of difference and you really had another industrial revolution taking place. This is an example of a Bessemer converter. So if you look at that picture before, you were making a couple hundred pounds a time in those crucible steel mills. So what Bessemer did was uh, had an invention where you could actually take liquid iron and multiple tons at a time, pour it into this uh, fire brick lined vessel and blow air through it. As you blow air through that liquid iron, it burns out the carbon and you're left with a uh, a very low amount of carbon in there and you can actually add back in the amount of carbon that you want in a controlled scenario. Um, when you uh, look at the Bethlehem Iron Company, they had four of these converters in the 19th century. 
and each made seven tons of steel each. Um, the air is being blown in through this pipe in the middle uh, because these things are actually on trunnions. They rotate and spin. And the air gets piped down to the bottom and then blown back up in the vertical uh, position. So the, the air bubbles up from underneath and burns out the carbon. And as it burns out, you produce a spectacular show of fireworks that lasts about 10 to 20 minutes. And at the end of it, theoretically, you come out with steel. Now, an interesting Bethlehem connection is Bethlehem purchased the Cambria Iron Works. And in the 1850s, they were working with Kelly, who was uh, pioneering the same idea that Bessemer had of blowing air through iron to burn out the carbon, and therefore uh, get the carbon content down to where it would be uh, converted into steel. His experiments were less than commercially successful, to say the least. But uh, he did have the idea. So when Bessemer finally came, uh, his ideas finally came to America, uh, he had to combine with Kelly and uh, work with a patent pool to get these things out into the mills. So uh, this original Kelly converter still survives today. It's owned by ArcelorMittal and uh, on loan to the Smithsonian Institution. So once you got into the era of Bessemer steel, we realized it was possible to make steel on industrial scale. That's when you started seeing things like the blast furnaces we have here in Bethlehem today slowly emerge and grow. After Bessemer, where you're making steel at seven tons of scale, they look at how do you wrap this up? Because seven tons isn't going to build railroads uh, across the continent very fast. And it certainly did, but you would need more and more production. So you have these modern blast furnaces. This is a shot from uh, the uh, Mingo Junction steel plant in Ohio, which is gone now. But those furnaces were comparable in size to the ones in Bethlehem. Liquid iron coming out of the furnaces, flowing into hot metal cars. These things could call 250 tons of molten iron, and they would transfer these to the steel making furnaces. And then with more iron comes more byproducts. So the slag would actually come out into these big slag pots, uh, which required entire railroad cars to move them around. And we'll go into the story of how blast furnaces work and steel making furnaces work in detail in later lectures. But uh, the bottom line with the steel making furnaces, you want to find a way to lower that carbon. With Bessemer converters, your problem with that was you really didn't have very good metallurgical controls. When your entire process took place in the span of 10 to 20 minutes, it was really easy to mess it up. These guys were just eyeballing the flames coming out and trying to predict when the carbon level was right. And you really didn't have time to do metallurgical tests on it before the stuff cooled down. So the open hearth furnaces uh, that were developed very quickly after uh, Bessemer in the succeeding decades uh, took eight to 12 hours to make their batch of steel, which for production is a big issue but the quality went up enormously, so it was more than worth the, pay, the trade off. This is a diagram showing how they work. You blow uh, air and gas through a refractory brick checker work. It gets uh, ignited by, actually, yeah, the air, yeah, ignited by a gun that uh, shoots gas or oil over the hearth of uh, steel that you're gonna melt down. You can take liquid iron and convert it uh, into steel or it could combine it with scrap iron or even do what they call a cold charge which is strictly scrap metal and melt it down. What makes these furnaces work is the heat that's taken off of them doesn't go straight up a smokestack. Before that happens it goes through that another set of refractory brick uh, checker works. Those bricks get warmed up and then after about um, an hour, hour and a half or so you can actually reverse the airflow, blow cold air over those hot bricks that hot air uh, is what gets uh, ignited and feeds the flame of the fire. So that fire gets way more intense. And it's that fire combined with the preheated air that actually gives you the heat to melt the steel. And because you have refractory brick chambers at both ends of the furnaces, uh, you're able to go back and forth uh, heating and uh, preheating and allows you to run these, these furnaces uh, uh, day in and day out. And some of the larger furnaces at Bethlehem at their Spurs Point operation could make 400 tons of steel in a batch. And there would be multiple furnaces in a single building and multiple shops of furnaces at a mill. So Bethlehem PA at their peak had four open hearth shops. The open hearth, uh, while it was great in terms of uh, productivity and quality, they realized if you could knock that eight to 12 hours down, uh, you would be saving a lot of money you can make more steel with less equipment. 
So in the 1950s, uh, the lens Donowitz converter was developed in Austria. Uh, Americans would know this as the basic oxygen furnace. This is what one looks like in operation. It's a big vessel. Uh, looks a lot like those old Bessemer converters because it's very similar in function to it. But instead of blowing air up from the bottom, which blows oxygen uh, plus the 78% of air, which is not oxygen, into the seal uh, or iron, uh, depending on where you are in the process, uh, Lenz Donowitz converter or a BOF, basic oxygen furnace, which is what we call in America, blows pure oxygen into it. Bessemer back in the 1850s knew that this was the way to go, but he didn't have an industrial supply of oxygen. So he had to live with uh, air and all of the problems it brings. But by the 1950s, 60s, we were able to start using oxygen to burn off the carbon, and you're able to make a really high quality product in under 40 minutes. And you can make hundreds of tons at a time. So in Bethlehem, two of these converters replaced uh, three buildings full of furnaces. The fourth open heart furnaces was converted to an electric uh, furnace melt shop. This is a photograph of our electric furnace. Uh, it's a 10 ton capacity unit, and you can see the electrodes on top. Uh, just imagine like a welder making sparks, melting the steel, the same very, very basic process goes on here. There's a whole lot more we can go into. I know our presentation's running kind of long already. So there's two basic types of electric furnaces, AC and DC. Uh, one has uh, three electrodes coming in from the top, uh, melts a pool of iron at the bottom. And then uh, uh, the other one has a single electrode coming in at the top and then an entire uh, bottom that has electrodes coming up. Uh, I mean, we can go into a, a whole lecture about the benefits AC versus DC and why one some mills use one technique and the other. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, these electric furnaces uh, became popular um, in the late 20th century. They certainly had them earlier, even in the 19 teens. But when you look at steel making today, remember that all those hundreds of years of making wrought iron, cast iron, and uh, from 19th century on, industrial scales of steel, all that steel had to go somewhere when you were done using it. So think about how often you, you uh, buy a new car, maybe once every five, 10, if you're frugal, 15 years. Uh, those old cars have to go somewhere, so uh, they end up getting melted down, and it's usually a DC or AC electric arc furnace that ends up melting these things down and recycling them. That's why you see a significant portion of the steel in this country isn't made from raw materials like iron ore. Uh, it's actually made from remelting old steel, and that's what electric furnaces uh, are really great for. There's other types of electric furnaces, like induction furnaces that are used for smaller scale operations. These take a coil of electric current, wrap it around uh, the steel, and it melts inside uh, uh, the crucible that the uh, coil is wrapped around. And that's uh, uh, one of uh, several ways of making steel. There's more like uh, stainless steel, we'll have to get into another lecture. But hopefully this gave you a good overview of the different types of iron and steel. And if anybody has some questions, feel free to let us know. I hope this was helpful and hope you learned something. All right, Mike, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay, I think we only have a couple questions. Uh, let me pull up here. Uh, someone had asked if you know what year the couple of furnaces that you, um, that you showed, what year they were from. Um, those ones were probably early 20th century in uh, the Bethlehem Steel photograph. Uh, that photograph was dated, uh, I think, from the 1940s, and they installed the furnaces uh, right around the turn of the century, 18, late between, eight, between the 19th and 20th century. Okay. And, uh, they, they uh, also continue, like they put, a, I think, another one in the 50s. I saw some documents on, um, but those cupola furnaces uh, are really, really basic technology. So if you look at the smaller ones I showed in the photograph, like that portable one. I mean, you can go and actually build one yourself out of like, like an old tank and melt something together in uh, your backyard if uh, you have a friend with a, like a fab shop with a plate roller. Hmm. I mean, there's uh, Amish foundries that uh, use old uh, water tanks that uh, they uh, line with refractory brick and build a furnace from. Interesting. Um, someone else asked um, if you know, there's always been some discussion about the metal used to build a Titanic. Did it use iron or steel, do you know? 
Uh, that was uh, that would be steel. Um, if I look, I can't remember if it was Bessemer or Open Hearth. Um, but uh, we can certainly find that information out. It should be documented uh, fairly well. Okay. Um, and someone asked, what the type of electric furnace is sitting out in the area outside of the museum? Uh, that's a 10 ton capacity uh, AC electric arc furnace that was used at Bethlehem Steel's Homer Research Labs. Okay, I think that is all of the uh, questions that we have that wrote in. I want to thank everybody that joined us online for coming to another virtual museum presentation. And thank you, Mike, for presenting a, a nice bit of history. Again, we have a lot of other programs coming up throughout the month of May. Uh, we have a very busy schedule for everybody at home. Uh, you can find more about those programs. We're going to be adding them on our Facebook page uh, right here. And you can also find them at nmih.org on our website. And if you enjoyed this program, there's a couple different ways that you're able to to help us out right now. Um, one is making a donation to the museum to help us continue these great programs to help bring you content online while we can't have the museum open. Another is purchasing a membership to the museum, which will get you an entire year of membership from the day that we reopen the museum. And the last one is if you're using Amazon uh, to order things from home, please consider using Amazon Smile. You can go to smile.amazon.com instead of just amazon.com. Select the National Museum of Industrial History as your charity of choice. And part of your order will go to benefit the museum without any additional cost to you. Uh, again, thank you all for coming out. Thanks, Mike, for a great presentation. And sure. come back for more for the rest of May. Back so everybody. What you can say about this. There's so many more details. But uh, hopefully it was helpful to you all. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome.